So among the questions that thinkers of deep thoughts like to ask is, what is law and what is property? So at the risk of not being big think, uh, I won't fo focus on either of these questions. Uh, instead, I'd like to consider uh, how scholars and sometimes even judges and lawyers uh, treat law and especially property law as a set of outcomes or results, uh, or at most as a collection of uh, disconnected rules. I call this uh, treatment of law, law as a heap, a heap of results, a heap of rules, uh, and this heap picture should be deeply puzzling. And so my goal today, uh, my first goal is to show why this uh, picture of law as a heap is puzzling. Uh, I would add even that it's puzzling that this is puzzling, uh, and that would make this a meta puzzle, and I guess that's the closest I'm gonna come to big think, because anything meta has to be big, right? Um, so uh, let's just jump in uh, and ask, where did this law as a heap idea come from? Well, one source is uh, legal realism, uh, a movement uh, in law that flowered in the 1930s uh, and still forms the background to a distinctly American approach to law and legal theory. Uh, the theme of 20th century property theory in particular, since legal realism, uh, is the analysis of property as a bundle of rights or a little metaphorically as a bundle of sticks, each right being a stick. Uh, if that's the case, then ownership can be uh, thought of as a bundle of rights or a bundle of sticks, including the right to exclude, the right to use, maybe different rights to use, the right to transfer, the right to destroy, and so on and on. The bundle, as conventionally conceived, is maximally protean, you can change it uh, in many ways, and nominalist, uh, meaning that uh, we can figure out on policy grounds what should be in the bundle and what shouldn't be in the bundle, uh, and then in nominalist fashion, we can slap the meaningless label of property on the bundle if that makes us feel better, uh, but it really doesn't amount to much at all. Property itself is just a word. So let me complicate this standard law as a heap picture with an analogy to a biological evolution. Okay, and analogies have to be taken with a grain of salt, and I'm going to be very specific about what I do and don't mean here. So biology, uh, uh, evolution in biology, uh, rests on genetics, and for a long time, genes were regarded in some sense as a heap. So classically, genes were assumed not to interact uh, directly or in any interesting fashion, uh, and that's changed a lot in recent years. Uh, so now interaction is uh, allowed for, uh, epistasis and epigenetics uh, being um, uh, two kinds. Uh, and the, uh, for, one for one example, and this is probably familiar, uh, we now have the idea that one gene can express, suppress uh, the expression of another or can even lead uh, to change in another gene. The big question here uh, is whether sticks in the property bundle behave in a similar fashion. Uh, do the sticks in the bundle, the rights that make up property, interact in a similar epi uh, fashion? Okay, is there sort of an epistasis and so forth here? And the possibility here is uh, depicted uh, in the slide uh, as ones and zeros uh, for the n number of rights. So each right is a little box here, and if you have it, it's one, and if you don't have it, it's zero. I borrowed this uh, from uh, Austin and Mueller's uh, uh, paper from two years ago. Uh, and then the idea would be that uh, these rights could be the right to farm, the right to draw water, the right to park a car. Now, what's true of some of these rights is that some of them alter the effects of others, like the right to farm and the right to water probably interact, uh, but the right to park a car might or might not uh, interact with them. Uh, and that's represented here by the links here, uh, K in number, uh, between uh, these various rights. Some are connected, some are not. So why does this matter? Uh, so what matters here is that when we are selecting a bundle, uh, whether that's happening spontaneously because some bundles survive better than others, or because we're doing trial and error, or we're designing a bundle from scratch, uh, the idea is that the evolution of the bundle will be very different depending on how many and what kind of interactions there are here. In other words, these links. So that brings us to these three diagrams. So these are uh, fitness landscapes. So fitness is on the vertical axis. And these are familiar from uh, evolution. And these depict three very different uh, scenarios. 
So moving from left to right, we get landscapes uh, depending on how many interactions there are among the constituents. Here, sticks in the bundle of rights. So on the left, we have k equals zero, meaning that all of these rights are kind of freestanding. In some sense, you can mix and match, uh, and they don't interact at all. Now, that means that when we evaluate whether a bundle is better or worse, we have a very simple task. We can just ask, did that stick get better by being there or not? Did that choice make things better? And so when we make our choices, we have this uh, fitness landscape where it's always unambiguous where we're going. The overall fitness landscape looks like Mount Fuji. Now, not quite, uh, but it's smooth. It's, uh, Mount Fuji is famously smooth uh, uh, mountain. Uh, the basic idea then is that we can tinker and we're uh, basically making our way up Mount Fuji. Uh, that's the conventional bundle of rights picture. Uh, and that's what makes the bundle of rights uh, so uh, easy to get a handle on. On the right side, uh, we have uh, the situation where every right potentially or actually interacts with every other. Uh, and the landscape is super jagged. The, pro the problem is you change one thing and who knows what's going to happen. All sorts of things will happen. Might get worse, might get better. Uh, but uh, any little change is likely to have lots of uh, ripple effects. The middle system is in between. It covers a lot of spe uh, the spectrum. Here, the system is complex, but not fully interactive. In a sense, this is a toy version of that. There, there are links, but there are not links everywhere. Uh, so there's some structure, but uh, only some structure. And that, I submit, is exactly where the law actually lives. And correspondingly, we can tinker with one part of the system, and some things will change. But thankfully, not everything will change. Uh, and the question is what will and what won't. But one thing that we have to uh, reconcile ourselves to is that when we tinker, we might be going up the highest peak or we might not. We might be going up one of these foothills. Uh, and so uh, the journey is not as uh, predictable as if we were uh, on the side of Mount Fuji on the left there. Uh, and so the, basically, the better we understand the picture in the middle, the better we're going to be able to make reforms that will do more harm than good. OK, well, that's all pretty abstract and uh, big think. Um, so let's get to the heart of the problem. Uh, what is the heart of the problem? Well, the heart of the problem is complexity. Uh, these links uh, in the, uh, the previous slide, uh, the one before the last. Uh, and uh, why is property a complex system? Because uh, a complex system is one where the parts, there are many parts, and they interact uh, so strongly that it's difficult to infer the parts of the whole from the uh, parts of um, the, the individual parts. So uh, uh, a complex system uh, will have properties at the system level that are hard to predict uh, from just looking at the pieces and adding up uh, what's happening to each individual piece. Uh, it's nonlinear. And complex systems as a, uh, a whole uh, show uh, phenomena that are hard to get a handle on but are not impossible to deal with, and that's the whole subject of complex systems theory, namely adaptation, feedback, input, output, uh, and self-reference, where the system makes reference to itself. Now, some systems are broken into components or modules. Think of a car. Uh, there's a brake system. There's an air conditioning system. There's a horn and so forth, and they're somewhat separate from each other, uh, and that makes a car much easier to, uh, to deal with. The middle fitness diagram here uh, might well reflect uh, such a system, and I would submit uh, property is like that as well. Uh, and that's why we can get a handle on how the micro, namely individual rights and uh, features of the bundle, uh, relate uh, to the big picture. So that's still a pretty big thing. So let's get more specific. Uh, and that brings us to a couple of examples. Now, these are just examples. I pick them to be really simple, so in some sense I'm cutting against the whole idea of property as a complex system, uh, but they're only there to give a flavor. So how does all this apply, apply to property? Well, here the first example is the right to roam, uh, and in several countries of northern Europe there is a customary, long been a customary right to roam over private land. Uh, and more recently, a uh, stronger version of this right to roam has been enacted by statute uh, in England uh, and in Scotland, uh, the Scottish version being uh, the strongest, uh, uh, stronger of the two. 
Uh, and in the property theory literature, this was almost universally regarded as having no real downside. It was almost like, hey, why didn't we think of this before? What, what could go wrong? Um, and uh, it's a very appealing notion, uh, especially since it rests uh, on a customary foundation. Of course, it's much stronger than the customary foundation. Uh, but recent empirical work um, by Jonathan Click and Gideon Parkamovsky suggests that the right to ro roam did uh, depress market values of land subject to the mandate. Now, that just shows, if this uh, empirical work pans out, that the right to roam is not an unalloyed good. It doesn't show that it's a bad idea. Uh, and especially it doesn't show that the customary form of this right to roam was a bad idea, uh, considering that the customary form was different. But it does show that it's right to ask whether the right to roam, and in its various versions, customary, statutory, of various strengths, interacts with other rights uh, in the bundle. Uh, so wh what is the situation with k the k number of links there? Another kind of interaction, which is in some sense more disturbing, uh, is feedback. Now, uh, feedback is very familiar. It's kind of a, I guess there was a trend at one point where feedback was a big deal uh, in the culture. Um, feedback is familiar from microphones, which thankfully this one uh, isn't showing. Um, but feedback happens in this system in uh, uh, disturbing ways, and one very simple way, but not so simple that it was anticipated, was what uh, Dan Kelly calls uh, strategic spillovers. In a strategic spillover, somebody creates a nuisance or something that's almost a nuisance uh, in order to extort a payment from the neighbors. So one notorious example is uh, the livery stable scam, which was a... Uh, scam among many scams in Chicago in the 19th century. I'm from Chicago, I get to say that. Uh, and uh, that was where somebody would open a horse stable uh, in a residential area in order to annoy neighbors, think uh, noise, smell, etc., uh, in order for them to pay uh, to, uh, to this uh, scamster in order to shut down. Uh, this is a livery stable in Los Angeles. Sorry, I couldn't even get a Chicago example. Uh, and it's now like some boutique-y place that's not a horse stable anymore, uh, not surprisingly. Um, a more recent uh, example is uh, depicted, um, sort of depicted here. Um, that's pollution entrepreneurs. Uh, th that's the phrase. Uh, who open uh, factories in China for the express purpose of garnering subsidies for abating uh, emissions of HFC-23, a very powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, and needless to say that opening factories in order to be shut down, uh, it wasn't a purpose of the program, uh, but uh, that's the way sometimes uh, things work out. Now you might say, well, okay, shouldn't we have anticipated this? Perhaps, uh, but the idea is that uh, once we start recognizing strategic behavior and feedback effects, there are a lot more complicated examples than this. Uh, and so again, the bundle is connect, the rights and duties and so forth are connected, but in very, in this case, devious ways, because after all, the people who are inhabiting this world have minds of their own. Finally, uh, that gets us back to uh, uh, the question of why is this puzzling? Uh, maybe this is the meta puzzle. Why isn't property treated as a complex system more? Uh, why do we even talk about property as if it weren't a complex system? Uh, why hasn't this whole style of sort of epi thinking that's been true not just in genetics but in many other areas uh, come to the study of law? Why are we so behind? Uh, why haven't we joined this party? Uh, isn't law the quintessential complex system? Uh, isn't there something weird going on? So I think there are some interlocking reasons for this, and I'm not going to be exhaustive, but I think uh, that there are um, they're true uh, as far as they go. One reason is tractability. So assuming a non-interactive bundle makes things easier. Uh, it makes it easier to study. You look at your stick, you're an expert on the stick. Uh, and it's comforting to think that when we're uh, tinkering with the stick, we're c climbing up the side of Mount Fuji rather than uh, something more complicated than that. Relatedly, the law as a heap conception, uh, rather than law as a complex system, the law as a heap conception makes reforming the heap look a lot easier. Uh, think Mount Fuji again. Uh, and so all we have to do is basically improve one stick in the bundle and uh, we're that much up higher up the side of the mountain. The flip side of all this is that um, 
uh, appreciating property as a complex system makes uh, some uh, traditional property doctrines, uh, the ones that make the bundle stick together, uh, look more sensible. Now, I, am, I will hasten to add that this is not an apology for the way the law is or was at any given point in time. Uh, and it's not a plea for formalism or that the law is always right or that property can never change. Nor is it a, a plea for uh, property to be just law in the books. Uh, on the contrary, uh, complex interaction in property law is a fact of life. And that's what people in other areas have discovered, and we will too. Uh, so it's really a part of the law in action. And so recognizing law as a complex system is about as realist as you can be. Moreover, in an era of greater computing power, it is likely that uh, regarding property this way will be theoretically and practically a lot more important than it has been. So I would say, again, nothing could be more realistic. Thanks. <laughs>